Welcome back 4061ers. This will begin our formal treatment of pipes and their close cousins FIFOs, which are like a pipe that exists on the file system. If you're reading along at home, you'll want to be having a look at Stevenson Rago, chapter 15. The first few sections of this uh, deal with pipes and also with FIFOs. Our goals are generally to review quickly what comprises the pipes, uh, spend a little bit of time discussing pipelines, and either later in this session or in the next section, uh, talk a little bit about FIFOs. Uh, we may also spend a little bit of time looking back at a few other odds and ends, uh, such as the select system call. Uh, and it's also the case that we're looking at some uh, things in homework right now that look back a bit, uh, recursively traversing directory trees and the related NFTW, uh, which is short for a, a file tree walk. Uh, these things will have some play in Project 2. I am not particularly happy that I still haven't yet been able to release it, uh, but I guarantee that you'll be happier with the results once I get it done right. So to that end, uh, let us move ahead and take just a brief moment to recall what exactly is a pipe. As a warm up exercise, uh, see if you can recall those things. What are they good for, and how does one set one up either in C or on the command line shell? Uh, if those things take a little bit of recollection for you, pause the video for a second and think about them. Or try and recall some system calls and shell uh, syntax if you're so inclined. And this is probably long enough to pause on that front. Uh, so to move ahead, just to briefly recall that a pipe is an internal communication buffer that can be provided by the operating system. It originated in Unix, but is, I believe, somewhat widespread now in that there are similar facilities in other operating systems, including Windows, although they may not be called pipes there. What I think distinguishes pipes is that they've been around for a long time and they're excessively simple. So it's very low overhead to set them up either at the system call level or in the command line shell. And you can see that down here that setting up a pipe itself is really easy uh, with the pipe system call. All you need to do is to provide a small array of two elements of integers uh, that are filled in with the file descriptors. Uh, those file descriptors, I think this is the zeroth one is for writing and the other, uh, the oneth one is for reading. Well, I can never remember exactly. One's for writing, one's for reading. Uh, and this allows then any process that has access to those uh, file descriptors uh, to read and write. Usually this is done in the context uh, of a plan to fork in a moment. Uh, for instance, a parent sets up a pipe and when it forks, the child will share the pipe with the parent allowing communication between the two. On the command line, it's even easier. You put a vertical bar uh, uh, between two commands. This will cause the output of command one to be read as the input of command two. And this is why that vertical bar here has become uh, known as a pipe uh, in shell parlance. The history of pipes and pipelines is somewhat interesting. Uh, the notion of a pipeline is just a bunch of programs strung together where the outputs of an earlier program become the inputs of a later one. Uh, we demonstrated that just a moment ago up here on this command 1 feeding into command 2 in terms of output. Uh, this was a result of the early development in Linux in, one of its, uh, in which one of its founders, um, uh, McIlroy, uh, he noticed that he wrote a lot of programs that would simply direct their output into some temporary file, an output file, uh, and then another program they could run moments later would use that as an input file. And this necessitated him then eventually going and cleaning up those uh, temporary files as they were. And it dawned him that maybe it would be a good a sort of facility that the operating system provide an automatic means that alleviated any shell programmers of the need of uh, allocating that disk space and then cleaning it up later on. Uh, and so the story goes that in one feverish night, uh, he and Ken Thompson added this uh, pipe system call uh, and implemented a shell syntax for it with that vertical bar. And the next day, uh, all of the programmers that were working on Unix at the time uh, had a <laughs> orgy of one-liners as everybody joined in the excitement of plumbing. Uh, it should be said they had a good sense of humor, those early uh, Unix folks. But the main intent then is that the pipe alleviated the need for temporary files. It's also the case that the pipe is usually allocated in RAM uh, and so is faster than having programs write to disk 
uh, permanent storage and then read from disk. Although, as we've discussed, in most cases, as you work with files, at least part of them are in RAM anyway, in temporary buffers that the operating system allocates. The pipe just takes that to its logical conclusion, that it's an entirely RAM-based buffer in most cases, and so is fairly efficient for one program to write into. It's just moving things into main memory, which are then read by another program. But uh, the interface to it looks like a file, as in uh, back here you have these two file descriptors and you make standard read and write calls from them. So this is a sort of uh, ingenious way to make it simple for two programs to cheaply talk to one another. Uh, in terms of how you see them work, a, a sort of classic example is to make use of pipes to count the number of files that are in a directory. A standard C solution to this would make use of some of the system calls that we've discussed and are the subject of one of your homeworks right now. Uh, the open dir and read dir uh, system calls allow you to open up a directory and then scan through the contents of it. Now you can do this in a loop in a C program and then just spit out this is how many files I saw in this directory. Uh, the alternative uh, is if you're familiar with ls, then you can probably locate either by memory or by looking through its manual page uh, some option that will spit out the count of files rather than listing all of them. Uh, a final solution is just to uh, ls the contents of a directory into some temporary file uh, and then use some utility like wc, uh, sort for word count, to count the lines in that. But the pipe solution is probably the one that uh, resonates most with folks who are familiar with the main intent of ls to list, main intent of wc to count. Uh, in this case, you can string the output of ls uh, to become the input of wc, uh, and this will spit out then the number of lines uh, that ls would have output, which is the number of files in a directory. Uh, to demonstrate that, uh, up here I have today's code pack uh, with some temporary files or backup files and some things that are compiled. If I ls, you see all of those on here. Uh, and if I pipe that as uh, input to word count, uh, you'll see there are 12 words, 12 lines, and 155 characters. I can adjust that so I only get the line count here with the dash L, uh, and there's your pipe-based solution. Uh, it's a lot simpler in many respects than having to write my own C program for it. And this ability to combine tools is what led Unix to develop this philosophy uh, of small, sharp tools that are easily combined. Pipes play into that mentality very, very strongly, and I'm not sure how it would work otherwise. A few notes about pipes, as uh, there's been some discussion of their merits and uses uh, over the course that you know, bears just a little bit of, um, um, uh, sort of attention uh, from us. Uh, there's a semi-famous article in Unix Circles uh, that was part of the Programming Pearls uh, set of articles uh, that came out from the uh, communications of the ACM 1986. The web link here is still active, I think, so if you click on it, it'll take you to a web browser, and you can uh, potentially look at the whole thing, although my internet's a little slow at the moment. Yeah, not programming pros. Uh, some nice person is violating copyright at the moment uh, to preserve this uh, nugget of goodness here. Uh, it's an article that generally just discussed uh, programming practices, and it was kind of cool back in the day that you'd see in a high-level publication like this, not discussions of machine learning uh, and theory of distributed systems and so forth, but just really pragmatic stuff like how do you find the most frequent words uh, in a file of some sort. And that was a subject of this uh, article uh, that discussed uh, the problem of top K words. You have a text file uh, and an integer, k like 10, and the objective of the program is to read through the text file and determine what are the top 10 most frequently occurring words in that text file. There are two folks that weighed in on this, and the primary sort of respondent to this was Donald Knuth. Uh, he's one of the godfathers of CS. Uh, you'll see his name bantered about in a sort of uh, awe and shock. Uh, he's the author of this voluminous uh, set of books, The Art of uh, Computer Programming, uh, and is well known as a crack programmer himself. Uh, his solution for this uh, was written in an older language, uh, sort of pseudocode and uh, at times... Uh, 
uh, delving into actual code in Pascal, but it's about eight pages of text and pseudocode there. Uh, part of his purpose here was to demonstrate a technique that he was advocating for called literate programming, in which you could write a sort of essay about what the program does and include bits of source code, and then his literate programming system would extract the text of the code and uh, put that into a compilable form. So you could give these very long explanations for what was going on in the code, and you can see the stuff that's present here uh, with program and uh, description and, and parts that follows his style, and a lot of the stuff that's actual code or pseudocode here uh, could be pulled out and then compiled into something else. Um, this is a really interesting approach to it. It develops a sort of uh, try like data structure, uh, which uh, sort of is efficient in determining um, the letter by letter uh, words and whether they occur and adding on to them and so forth. Uh, it was a really interesting um, sort of discussion and demonstrated his programming prowess along with the literate programming technique. Uh, but there was one flaw that McIlroy identified and offered an alternative to it. And it was that the solution that Nuth provided was way too freaking long and hard to understand uh, unless you were willing to devote lots and lots of time. But Colroy, uh, he advocated for instead a really short uh, set of Unix commands that were strung together using pipes. And so what you see here uh, with the little vertical pipes here is the output of one program becoming the input of the next program. Uh, what you see on the slide here is a slight modification of what McIlroy actually advocated for to begin with. Uh, he didn't write it as a script that would be stored to file. He just said, well, I mean, this is short enough. I'll just type it on the command line. So it was only six lines rather than the nine or so lines of code and the parameter set up uh, here. Uh, but the flavor of this is generally the same. Uh, the gist of it is you need to output the file in some way. Uh, you need to uh, transform any of the input characters that are not alphabetic, that don't comprise a word, uh, into some other non-printing character. Uh, McElroy favored new lines because this put every word essentially on its own line then. And you'll have to understand that there are a few caveats to this, for instance, uh, contractions like don't that have an apostrophe in it get clobbered a little bit in this, but um, who's counting on that front? Uh, then uh, this TR utility is used to transform all uppercase uh, letters to lowercase letters so that there's uniform case as you're counting. You use the sort utility that sorts all of the output that's coming out of this uh, into alphabetic order. The unique utility, uh, which will take sorted inputs and merge any adjacent entries. Uh, uh, so for instance, uh, if the word the appeared six times, it would merge into a single occurrence of the, with the dash C option puts a little dash, uh, count in front of it. So you'd see six and then the, uh, to indicate uh, the occurred six times. Um, sort, uh, and this again will sort the input, but this time in reverse numerical order, uh, so that the first field, uh, which is the count of words generated by unique, uh, because it uh, would uh, cause all of the most popular frequent words uh, to percolate up to the top of the output. And finally, uh, head, which just presents the first few lines of outputs. In this case, if the input parameter k was 10, uh, then I'd print out the first 10. Um, so this nine line Unix script uh, or six line uh, one offer uh, that, uh, or one liner that uh, McIlroy suggested, uh, it comprises all of the functionality that Donald Noose eight pages of Pascal and pseudocode comprise. I think I have this uh, code in the, uh, yeah, uh, in the, um, the source pack so you can experiment with a little bit. Uh, here it is, uh, and I think right now it's set up to be executable. Yeah, so we can execute it. Uh, and I have a lorem ipsum here. I don't know, uh, yeah, I think I, we could come around this. So this is a, a fairly long uh, line uh, series of text that we can just look at what are the most popular words in it. So it'd be top k dot shell uh, on lorem ipsum and show me the top 10 words. Uh, I'll see, I got the, the order wrong there, so it should be 10 first, and then the, the file name. So Ipsum uh, occurs with 9, uh, 8 for in, and so forth. Uh, you can, if you like, uh, experiment a little bit with uh, what the outputs of each of these are. Uh, for instance, if I uh, cut out at this point uh, all the rest of this stuff, 
uh, and put a little uh, comment here. What I get is the output of the pipeline at this point after uh, transliterating and then sorting stuff. Uh, so at this point, uh, you'd see uh, the output over here uh, where all of these uh, oots uh, come in as uh, uh, sort of repeated words due to the sorting that has occurred. Uh, and then if I uncomment this part and show this is what the output of unique-c uh, looks like, if I add that onto the pipeline, uh, then you see these are unsorted, but I now have, uh, for instance, the four occurrence of oots that have been merged into a single line here. So this is a good way if you see a complex pipeline uh, to break it down to understand what exactly is happening at each stage of this. I'll leave this off uh, to make sure that future classes get a, a, a sound copy of this uh, program. Um, so at any rate, uh, what McIlroy is essentially advocating for is that shorter is better here. And while Donald Noose's uh, solution is elegant and probably way more efficient in terms of large inputs than what's present here, there's a different kind of efficiency that you'll always want to be aware of, uh, which is how long is it going to take you to program? Do you have the time to sit down and write eight pages of tree data structures uh, that will do this job right, as it were, in terms of uh, efficiently handling large inputs? Now, if that's the central mission of your business, which is uh, you know counting word frequencies for some reason, and uh, that program is going to be run hundreds of millions of times, then it's probably worth the investment of time up front uh, to uh, get really efficient uh, solution uh, that's going to work in, in the long run. Rarely is that the case, though, and you'll find in your working world that you have lots of sort of one-offs where you have to uh, figure out, okay, I just need to format this data in some way. Uh, the efficiency doesn't matter. I just need the result quick. And at that point, this kind of a script magic uh, becomes extremely useful because instead of spending a couple days uh, to work out what the solution is, you spend a couple seconds looking up man pages like, okay, what was the option that did this in unique? What was the option in sort uh, to sort in a certain way? And you as the programmer know you can combine all of them in this interesting way just to get the job done and move ahead with whatever your real goal is. To merge those two, though, I think it's important to realize that in a lot of cases, it's not worth it to spend your time optimizing something with a really big, complex program until it's really apparent that you spend a few months uh, using this script uh, for your business purposes and everything's going fine, then you just save yourself several days of work uh, by not writing that eight-page tree behemoth. And at the point that your manager comes and says, okay, we've got some free time here. It'd be nice to optimize the performance of various things. Uh, you look and see one of the slowdown points is uh, this sorting business. That's when you spend time uh, optimizing it. But having a solution that works fast in, in uh, terms of programmer time, uh, that's a, a more important uh, task. Uh, the thing that's 90% uh, right and already uh, finished is much better than the thing that's 100% uh, correct, but still theoretical and uh, on everyone's mind. So to underscore that point, um, let's talk just for a minute about tool familiarity. What was enabling this set of tools to combine uh, was the pipes, but you wouldn't be able to solve this problem using pipes. I mean, they don't solve anything on their own uh, unless you understand some of the component pieces that are present here. And Unix is full of these little text tools that can be combined in interesting ways in that respect. To motivate that, uh, here are two possible real-world problems uh, that you might face at some point, and they're representative of a whole class of sort of pragmatic programming issues uh, that uh, folks who work in the business are going to have to deal with. Um, the solutions don't necessarily have to involve pipelines in this case, uh, but the two problems are as such. Uh, you have a couple directories, uh, directory A and directory B. Uh, they have roughly 250 files in them uh, each, but in some cases, directory has slight, slightly different files uh, than directory B. Uh, and in some cases, directory B might have some more files that don't exist in directory A. And the job for you is to figure out what is the difference between these two. Uh, this can arise in all manner of different scenarios. Uh, me, I faced it several times where I'm moving between two computers and I think I copy all the files that I need, but then there are subtle differences. Uh, and so want to figure out uh, what is the difference between these two directory structures so I can make sure they're uh, relatively in sync. The other problem uh, comes from Steve Yegi and his interesting uh, but profane article, uh, Five Essential Phone Screen Questions. And if you're planning to interview anytime soon, uh, then you may want to have a look at that article. 
Uh, he stated it as follows, you have about 50,000 HTML files in a Unix directory tree uh, under some you know, file like our directory uh, called website. You have two days to get a list of file paths to, to the editorial staff. Uh, and what you're looking for in those HTML files is any occurrences of phone numbers that appear either parenthetically uh, with the area code followed by a space and then the rest of the phone number separated by a dash. Uh, or alternatively, some phone numbers appear in the area code dash uh, rest of phone number format that's listed down here. Um, so those phone numbers could appear anyplace else in the company's changing phone numbers. So you have to find all of the web page files that contain phone numbers so that they can be uh, changed. Uh, to that end, it's worthwhile then just to take a moment to ponder these two. How would you go about solving these two problems, either the difference between directories uh, or the find uh, phone numbers? I'll caution you that uh, the answer you're probably looking for here uh, is not to write a giant C program or a giant Java program or even a medium-sized Python program for this kind of stuff that there are shorter, sweeter answers uh, to this kind of thing. Take a moment, uh, ponder for a moment, and do a little research if you want. Uh, Googling in this case is probably okay because it'll get you set up and prepared for interview questions. So the basic paradigm that you want to learn is that the, these are not new problems uh, that instead uh, they have been around for quite a while and programmers having had to deal with them, write utilities or extend existing utilities uh, to allow you to, to deal with this. Uh, there's a hint in the first problem's name, the diff between dir A and dir B. There's a very, very common utility called diff and its intent is to show the difference usually between two regular files. But with the right invocation, you can actually ask not just for a difference between two f individual files, but between two directory uh, trees entirely. Uh, so over here, you see uh, diff-rq uh, lectures uh, and this lectures copy. Uh, the standard behavior of diff with no options just to show difference between two files, but the dash r is short for recursive. Uh, and Q is quiet, uh, which will only show the differences, not similarities between stuff. And when past directories instead of files, diff automatically adapts uh, to show the differences uh, based on those directory trees instead. Uh, so you see some of the reports here, uh, for instance, these two files, uh, .org and .org over here, uh, they are actually different. And rather than showing the differences, the Q just shows that these two files are, are, are different instead. Uh, these two PDFs are different. Uh, these two tech files are different. Uh, and only in the lectures, uh, there's this new file that's over here. It's not present in the copies of version of this. So this, uh, if you know something about diff and know about its capabilities, uh, is something you might sort of guess at. That uh, I, for instance, couldn't remember what the uh, options are to uh, do the recursive uh, quiet version of this, uh, but did have the hunch at least that this sounds like a problem that you could solve with diff with the right uh, set of options. So you buzz into the manual, uh, man diff, uh, and look around until you see uh, there's a way to invoke this on directories recursively uh, and limit the output to only what I'm interested in, uh, quiet in that case. It might take a few tries, but this is certainly going to go a lot faster if you're willing to read the manual page than writing a whole giant Python program that recreates the magic that's already baked into Unix. The other problem, uh, the phone number finding problem, uh, should probably s trigger those who have some knowledge of Unix tools to utter something like, uh, I think grep uh, could probably do this. Grep is this lovely little searching utility uh, that will search files for certain patterns in it, usually stated as regular expressions. And Yegi's solution that's provided here is a little bit complex because it makes use of these Perl compatible regular expressions, uh, which are a very extended language to specify patterns that you want to search for that appear in text. Uh, and you can see it's a little bit hard on the eyes. There are actually simpler versions of this that you might state out there, uh, but it gets the job done. And importantly, it's a one-liner, as in no giant C or C++ program uh, here. It's just invoking this standard utility to run recursively, uh, search everything in a directory tree, uh, and to list the files, that's the dash L part, and to state in some way this pattern, uh, that is a set of three digits uh, surrounded by parentheses uh, followed by a space, uh, or um, uh, a set of three digits uh, that are uh, sort of separated by a dash. 
Uh, so to that end, uh, the pattern here uh, that requires some doing, but it's something you can experiment with, especially if you have some test files uh, to look at there. Uh, so to that end, if you were aware of grep, at least in Steve's eyes, uh, then you could probably uh, get away with passing this interview question. But if you jumped immediately to the, I'm going to write a C++ program and use the uh, standard template libraries, regular expression engine to do that and uh, do so recursively and so forth, probably this would not be the best way to answer that interview question. It would move you up in terms of the rankings. And if you're interested in things like this, uh, utilities that allow you uh, to check various aspects of text and so forth, you might check out uh, the Tool Time Session 3, a series of lectures that are posted uh, on uh, YouTube. Uh, the third session dealt exclusively with some common text tools that are used to search and transform. Grep is covered in some more detail in there, and it's worthwhile if you're preparing for an interview um, to have a look at those. The next thing that we want to talk about, aside from the constituents uh, of uh, tools and Unix that you can combine with pipes, is to talk a little bit about the limitations of pipes themselves. There's uh, a well-known facet of them that they are not unlimited in size, that instead the typical implementation of them in Linux is only about 64 kilobytes, uh, 65,536 bytes uh, for those keeping track uh, at home. Uh, you can have a look at the program uh, fill pipe here, and we'll pull that up here. But the main thing that we're going to be driving at is that the fact that pipes have a limited size introduces a major flaw uh, in project one uh, that you guys implemented, this uh, commando uh, project. And we'll want to think a little bit about why, if the pipes have a limited size, this creates potential problems in commando that were unanticipated. Uh, maybe we want to revisit and have a look at what's going on with those. So uh, let's have a look first at this uh, fillpipe.c business. Uh, I'll pull that up here, fillpipe.c. Uh, you can see in here, uh, what I have is a pipe call uh, to fill in this little pip array with the read and write uh, file descriptors. Uh, and we're going to fork in this case. So the intent here is for the uh, program that's running uh, to fork off a child, which is going to be doing, in this case, uh, the reading for this uh, instance. Uh, and you can see the central loop for the child here uh, is to sleep for a second uh, and then read some stuff uh, to spit out its output using this uh, flush uh, and then read some more from the pipe. And it just does this in a continuous loop, so we'll eventually have to kill the parent and child uh, to get this to stop. Um, the parent, on the other hand, uh, it's going to constantly be writing this single character dash uh, to the pipe uh, and reporting how much it's reading as you go through. Uh, now, if pipes are sort of unlimited in size and scope, then what you'd expect is that this parent could chug along writing stuff uh, as fast as it, it wanted to. Uh, but we'll see, uh, what we'll see instead is that there's a limit to how much uh, the parent can actually write into this. So let me fire this thing up. Uh, oh yeah, and I should see, say again here, this is odd loop a syntax for four here. Uh, where there is no termination condition, so this is just going to loop forever as well for the parent. Uh, let me GCC this, uh, GCC fill pipe, uh, and I'll just run this thing, which will fire up uh, parent and child, and you can see this is writing and writing and writing, uh, and then there's a pause. And what you should note here from that, uh, so I find that, yeah, um, uh, Note that as I'm writing here, occasionally the child is uh, going to wake up uh, and uh, read stuff. Uh, and what you should see is that there was a pause right here, 65,536. Uh, this is where the, the parent sort of uh, 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 bailed out for a second. Uh, and if you come back down to this, uh, you can see the parent writes a whole bunch and then the child does some reading. <laughs> Uh, and to that end, the parent is on hold, uh, it seems like, whatever the child is reading. Part of this, then, uh, to understand is that the pipe is filling up, and the child, which is reading blocks of 1,024 characters here, uh, it is going to read off a hunk of this stuff, uh, and the parent is not going to get a chance to read or to write back to that pipe again until the, the pipe has been emptied somewhat. Uh, that at each stage here, uh, the parent is trying to write into a full pipe uh, and can't do so. It blocks on that until the child wakes up, reads some stuff from it, uh, and creates space in the pipe. 
Now it looks like the OS is not letting the parent run until uh, the child actually uh, reads more than a few chunks off of it. Uh, so there's uh, sufficient space in there for the, um, the parent process to continue writing in. Uh, but the main thing that I, I sort of take away from this uh, is the following, that if you try to write into a full pipe, you block. It's like uh, it's one of the few instances that we've seen so far in which writes can actually uh, put your whole process on hold. Um, we have seen at times that reading from files, in particular pipes as well, if there's nothing in the pipe yet, uh, this can cause hangups as well, uh, and we will I'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, but this size limit then on pipes now, means that once the pipe fills up, uh, and we saw that earlier on here that I could write sort of continuously uh, as the parent uh, until we actually got down here to the, uh, well, it's gonna take me too, uh, too long, I think, uh, to scan that way, uh, until we got to uh, so the pipe limit. Uh, and at that point, the parent can no longer write anything more into it and has to wait for a while until the child uh, reads. It uh, then very quickly um, fills up the space that the pipe uh, has uh, sort of opened up as the child read from it, uh, and the parent process blocks yet once again, uh, waiting until the, the child process uh, reads some stuff out of it to open up more space. So that blocking behavior then of uh, associated with uh, uh, writing faster than this child can actually read from it, um, this is the source of where you can see a design flaw that was present in Commando. And you have to think back to the way that the parent process, Commando, handled the output that was coming from children. That In that case, the SQL approach, uh, when someone typed in a command, like uh, here was uh, within Commando, uh, so you can, Commando, uh, you type something like uh, ls, uh, it would spin up a child process for this ls uh, and connect its output to a pipe that would be read from the, as the, uh, as input uh, in Commando itself. Uh, to that end, this process would dump all of its output into uh, the pipe, and then on being finished, it would, the sort of closing of it would be detected within Commando uh, by a wait, uh, wait PID, where it checked in and said, ah, my child process Alice is done. Uh, I will now proceed to read everything out of that pipe uh, into an internal buffer. And this was that command fetch output pro, um, uh, function that was present in Commando. The flaw with this is that if the child process generates more output than can fit in a pipe, as in suppose it generates 70,000 some bytes of output, it'll block at the point that it reaches 65,536, unable to continue because it can't produce any more output uh, that's gonna go into the pipe, the pipe is full. Unfortunately, that pipe is gonna remain full because Commando, uh, it was only ever going to read out of the pipe once the child process is done. And at the point that the child process can't complete because the pipe is full, and the Commando process is never going to open up any space in the pipe uh, 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 because it's only going to read out of that pipe once the child process is, uh, is actually finished, uh, then you have this deadlock as in the child process is waiting for Commando to open up space in the pipe uh, and so it can continue, but Commando is waiting for the child process to finish uh, before it will read anything from the pipe. This is a major design flaw that it's in project one. It's there just for simplicity uh, because otherwise handling this is a little bit uh, uh, tricky. Uh, in, there are all kinds of issues that are present there. Uh, for instance, it, uh, the obvious solution to this is to have a commando occasionally read output from the pipe so that it uh, frees up space um, emptying that pipe. But importantly, uh, you push the problem in a different direction then because if there's no uh, output in the pipe, uh, then Commando risks blocking as it tries to read things from the pipe. Um, so this is actually somewhat more difficult to solve than uh, what uh, uh, appears at first on, on that front. So answers to those sort of discussions uh, are present here. Uh, this deadlock or avoiding, uh, it, it's our first sort of instance of deadlock that one part of the um, programming system commando is expecting one thing while the other part the child process is expecting another thing and those two directly conflict and get each other sort of stuck in that, um, that respect. Uh, it's our first instance of deadlock um, and would need to be resolved with somewhat more complex mechanisms such as commando uh, at least partially emptying pipes so child processes can go uh, forwards although it need to do so with uh, while avoiding deadlocking itself. Oh, sorry uh, without blocking itself. 
Uh, that's beyond the scope of what our current discussion is, but we'll deal with issues like that uh, later on in probably the final project of the semester, which will deal with, uh, again, communication between programs. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention uh, that there are a couple convenience functions associated with pipes uh, that are worth a discussion. Uh, the P open and P close uh, functions are present actually in the C standard library. Uh, and these are useful in that they avoid the need to interact with the low level system calls associated with pipe. Uh, and you can see them as useful then potentially in C standard settings, that uh, there's something about the C programming system uh, that gives this higher level interface uh, making portable code on, on that front. Uh, so probably in um, uh, deployment on a Windows system, these P open and P close uh, functions, they would do something along the lines of using whatever the Windows equivalent it is, but uh, in Unix land, P open and P close would deal directly with uh, the pipe system call, most likely, uh, and the uh, low level sort of close routine here. And what's uh, you know, slightly interesting about this um, is that it combines several things into one uh, system call. It does a fork and exec to execute this command string over here and returns this uh, standard IO pointer uh, over here. Uh, sorry, uh, uh, so standard uh, IO sort of file descriptor over here, uh, or file handle, I guess, file handle, uh, this file struct over here. Uh, interestingly then, uh, this program that's gonna be run uh, in the background as a subservient a child process, you can indicate uh, whether you want it to produce output, in which case uh, you'll be um, reading uh, from the child, uh, or if you are going to be sending output to it, in which case this file will be opened up for writing and you can, it's connected to uh, the standard input for a command string. Uh, so anything that you write to this file script will be read by the, um, uh, the child process. Uh, this is demoed in a program uh, called pager demo. And if you are not familiar, the notion of a pager in uh, Unix is a little program that's meant to just conveniently display text. Um, so for instance, uh, actually I actually have to have a proper shell for, um, uh, to show this here because uh, Emacs is its own little pager there. Um, whenever you'd say man to, uh, let's, see, uh, uh, let's see, pipe like this, uh, what you're just seeing here in terms of output uh, is a pager of some sort because by default, uh, man will look for a pager in your system to show a screen. Uh, pressing the up and down arrows then moves you up and down. Pressing the space bar uh, moves you down by pages, up uh, by pages uh, in this particular pager, and Q will quit you out of it. Uh, anytime that you would want uh, to see a lot of text uh, that is being generated, but you want to see it in this more convenient light, it's standard practice to pipe this to a pager. Uh, so for instance, a moment ago we had this A dot out uh, that, uh, oh sorry, Need to get my command line here. Let's see, so this is here, and I'll probably change into this thing. We have this a dot out that was generating tons and tons of output. Uh, if I pipe that to the less command, which is a very standard pager, uh, then you get the same sort of output down here where spaces move down by pages. Uh, you will move me back up by pages. Uh, I can scan to the beginning, or potentially to the end of input, although that's problematic at times. Uh, and generally Q will get me out of uh, this thing. Uh, so pagers are super useful on, on, on uh, that front. Uh, this pager demo, uh, which we'll look at here, uh, let's see, it's called, yeah, uh, I think it's in here anyway. Uh, oh, hmm. Oh, it doesn't seem, seem to be here. I'm not sure where I put it right now. Uh, I'll poke around for that uh, and see if I can provide it in the actual uh, source file. But it just demonstrates uh, output of one program uh, coming in as inputs uh, to the parent program on, on, the, on that front. Uh, and so it shows the convenience of this style of pipe open um, uh, syntax that's present in the uh, the C standard library. Uh, you could do all of this with standard system calls. It would just take a little bit of extra code uh, because you'd have to set up the pipe, you'd have to set up the exec, uh, and uh, or sorry, set up the fork and the exec, a difference between parents and child. This paradigm of getting opening up a, a child process that is going to involve reading and writing, uh, it's so common uh, that this C standard uh, um, 
this C standard library call um, sort of synthesizes all of that and makes it a little bit more convenient uh, for you to, to, to set up. I'm going to pause for just a second and see if I can't locate that pager demo so we can have a look at it. All right. <laughs> It took me a little bit of uh, time in order to find that pager demo. Uh, interestingly, I had to resort to grepping like all of my past directories uh, for uh, 4061 in order to find uh, some student that had it in their pack because I apparently lost all copies of it. Uh, very shameful, but managed to get it back. Uh, and so let's have a look just quickly at what's present in here. Uh, what you can see in terms of the program structure is that the parent process, uh, the main that's present here, uh, its intent is going to be to feed input to this pager, which is going to be the child process. Uh, so to that end, what you see in the main uh, is an ask for a command line argument to be uh, provided. Uh, and then just a simple loop that will get uh, some uh, text uh, and then put it into a particular file descriptor, this FP out business down here. Uh, the FP out itself, this is where it's, uh, 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 we see the P open business uh, coming from, uh, that the P open is used to start up a child process uh, that's defined by pager. And up top that pager was here, it's that less program. Uh, and it's open in this case uh, for writing. So uh, the uh, file pointer that I'm getting uh, is open for writing, which means the child process is going to read output that this program, the parent main, is going to uh, be spitting into it. And so this loop is just picking up lines from the file that I make requests to, uh, writing it into that uh, output thing, which is being uh, read by the child process. And the main itself just opens up uh, whatever file is specified in the command line uh, for reading uh, so that it can read lines from it. Uh, to show this then in the uh, command line is fairly uninteresting. Uh, it's that GCC uh, pager demo. Let's see. Uh, if I try and run this, it requires a command line argument. Uh, so, for instance, I could uh, produce some output here. Uh, like we could uh, use this. Uh, uh, any of these, like multiple writes uh, dot C is the next uh, C program that we're going to use. So here's multiple writes dot C. Um, the main program is outputting this stuff, but it's being fed into the pager, uh, which is what's controlling the terminal at, at the moment. And you can see that as I press space, I go towards the end. Uh, there's nothing left. I can back up on that front and Q will get me out of this. So um, not particularly interesting in that respect, but shows the convenience of being able to, in one fell swoop, uh, set up uh, a child process, set up a pipe that's going to be communicated with that child process, and then start off the child process running a program, uh, executing it, as it were. All that is encompassed in one very nice uh, little package here, along with uh, providing a standard C output or input uh, file handle uh, that you can use with your favorite uh, fprintfs and so forth. So that in mind then, uh, well, our next sort of steps on this trajectory are to discuss uh, the FIFO, which is a close cousin to the pipe. We'll begin discussion of that in the next session, uh, but just as a preview, uh, pipes themselves, they have this major limitation in that they can only be used by processes that are in the same file or a same uh, process hierarchy. Uh, typically, this is a parent creates it and then all of the children that are forked off of that parent, they have access to it. This limits how pipes can be used between uh, processes, although the limits aren't initially apparent. Even things like pipelines on the command line uh, in the shell, uh, all of the children commands that you'd see uh, in a shell, uh, for instance, if I uh, did a uh, ls uh, to uh, sorts and then a word count, all of these three processes, ls, sort, and wc, they are going to be children of the same parent process, uh, the shell process that's running right now. Uh, so to that end, there isn't a major limitation in getting them to talk to each other because uh, they're all stemming from the same thing. But there are certainly cases where you could uh, envision, I don't have a process relationship between these two um, programs, uh, but I still want them to be able to communicate through something that's like a pipe. 
uh, the FIFO, or first in, first out, uh, is the bridge to that. And we'll see in the next session uh, that there's a way to uh, set this up so that the pipe itself has a place on the file system. Instead of being completely behind the scenes, accessible only through the system calls, uh, you can actually establish a name on the file system, although uh, associated with that pipe. And although this looks sort of like a normal file, it's not going to be a normal file. It won't have the same set of semantics associated with that. I'll look for that in our next session together, uh, and I'll see you then.